Hello. Continuing with our recent theme of witchcraft, today I want to talk to you about the reality behind the witch finder general, Matthew Hopkins. He is legendary for his forced confessions, multiple executions, burnings, and as a staple of horror, has cast a fearful shadow across nearly 400 years of history. But what was he really about? And is his reputation justified? Well, we shall see. If you've not heard of him, then Matthew Hopkins, the so-called witch finder general, was a freelance professional witch hunter who operated during the time of the English Civil War. And for someone who is as famous as he is, he has a remarkably short career. Basically, it only lasts from 1644 to 1647. And outside those years, he's pretty much unheard of, and we don't really know a great deal about him. And a lot of what we think we do know departs quite considerably from reality. Now, the image people most strongly associate with Matthew Hopkins is that cast by Vincent Price in the 1968 horror movie Witchfinder General, and it is a powerful Puritan image, but it is way, way too old, and this is our first major difference, our first major myth. We don't precisely know when Hopkins was born, but there are a few clues that can lead us to a closer result. We know his father was John Hopkins, who was a clergyman in the parish of St John's in Great Wenham in Suffolk. And we know from prior historians that his father received a legacy from one of his parishioners in 1619. This is important. The instructions in that will left money to John for the purchasing of Bibles for his three children, John, James and Thomas. Now you'll note there's no Matthew in that list. And that therefore allows us to determine he couldn't have been born before 1619, which makes him at the most 25 when he comes to prominence as a witch hunter. This is far younger than the 57 year old Vincent Price would show him in the movie. And while we're on the subject of Witchfinder General, Hopkins never actually referred to himself by that title in his own books, in his own travels, in his own works. It does get added to later editions, which are published after his death, but there's no actual evidence to support him using the title himself. Now, his fearsome reputation is one of torturing innocent victims in order to secure a confession of witchcraft, but is that really the case? Well, to be honest, this is a bit of a grey area as to whether or not his victims were innocent or tortured. Torture itself is actually illegal in the mid 17th century. And far from just going round the country burning people, because we didn't burn witches anyway, Hopkins was performing a legal service. He was there as an expert to provide the evidence. He was sort of your expert consultant to the court. Now, how he obtained that evidence had to be legal. It had to be above board and it had to be admissible in a court of law. Otherwise, there was no point in doing so. Now, we can call into question whether that which is legally obtained back then is fair, true, beyond reasonable doubt. We could also question whether what was legally sound and admissible in the court of law back then would still be legally sound today. This is the right debate to be having. All too often, though, we do get distracted by creating bogeymen and monsters out of these people, and we shouldn't. However, I digress. Since torture was illegal, Hopkins couldn't get his witchcraft confession by a good dose of the rack. However, he could deploy methods of interrogation that would raise inquiries and questions today. One of these being sleep deprivation. And this delivered him some results back in the early days of his career in the town of Manningtree in Essex, where after four days of being sleep deprived, an alleged witch confessed and called out the names of her nine familiars, which she allegedly proceeded to summon. Now, Hopkins claims that he and nine other witnesses saw the first five of these, although, reading his book, I have questions. It does appear that out of the nine familiars, the five witnessed bear the resemblance of common animals. Look at the famous illustration. There is Holt, like a white kitten. There is Jamara, who is like a fat spaniel with no legs. Although, if we do take a look at the illustration, you can see the sort of legs associated with a small dog. You've got Vinegar Tom with the body of a greyhound and the head of an ox. I'm going to keep an open mind on that one. Then you've got Sake and Sugar, 
which is like a black rabbit, and Newus, which is like a polecat. Now call me awkward, but reporting having seen a cat, two dogs, a rabbit and a ferret, in the presence of a woman, in a reasonably rural village setting, is hardly a good indicator of a pact with the devil, is it? Yeah. Now another of his more questionable methods of obtaining evidence was that of his team of witch prickers, and they would show that a woman, and it was always a woman, did not bleed when stabbed with a pin. Our first video that we ever did on this channel was actually Kyle talking about witch prickers and their use. Please do go give it a watch. Now sources tell us that he also used what is known as the swim test, and this is frequently confused with the use of ducking stools. The ducking stool is a form of punishment, not a form of trial. However, the swim test is based in the idea that somebody who has a pact with the devil would be rejected by the water and therefore float due to them renouncing their baptism. See, this has logic behind it. The accused isn't weighed down as folklore would have you believe. A rope is attached to them to pull them out of the water if they sink. The idea that you drown someone to prove their innocence is laughable even for the 17th century, and I do wish we could stop thinking like that. The truth of the matter is very few, if any, were actually convicted in England by the use of the swim test, and it was abandoned as a legal test in 1645. So while Hopkins may well have used it, he doesn't use it for that long. And note here, as we mentioned earlier, Hopkins isn't sitting in judgment of these people. He doesn't have the power to convict. The scarier part of this is that learned judges and clerics bought into this nonsense. And remember, people died as a result of this stuff. 500 of them, with Hopkins' evidence securing 100 of those. That's got to be the scariest thing that comes out of this legend. Now, he spoke a lot of his methods, he even wrote them down. You can find a lot of these methods and his justifications for using them in the book that he produced called The Discovery of Witches. And this is available to view online, free of charge, through the Gutenberg Project. We've put a link in the comments below. Do take care, though, not to confuse this with The Discovery of Witchcraft by Reginald Scott, which is actually a debunking of the existence of witchcraft or The Wonderful Discoveries of Witches in the County of Lancaster by Thomas Potts, which is a transcript of the Pendle Witch Trials. This particular discipline does like to reuse the title where it can. We look back at this sort of barbarism and often mock, but it's worth considering the treatment of religion in Puritan times to get a good understanding of this. This wasn't just something you believed or didn't believe. The existence of God and the devil was considered by all to be an absolute fact. And as God was always at work in your community, the devil was also always at work in your community. It wasn't a case of finding if the devil was influencing your village. It was a case of finding where the devil was influencing your village. So a travelling witch finder can be a vital service. In fact, it states in his book that towns and villages wrote to him requesting his visits. Now, with the advent of the Enlightenment and the rising power of science to counter the more extreme religion, we finally saw an end of this sort of witch hunt in England, with the last execution for witchcraft being that of Alicia Molland in 1684. The last witchcraft trial, however, was as late as 1944 with the prosecution of Helen Duncan, and the Witchcraft Act stayed on the statute books as late as 1951. So perhaps we didn't advance as quickly as we might like to think. At the end of all this, Hopkins died at his home on the 12th of August, 1647. And despite a legend arising that he was subject to his own swim test and executed as a witch himself, this is not remotely true. And he was buried in hallowed ground in the Church of St. Mary at Mistley Heath. And me... I'm glad to see the back of him. Thanks for watching. Do join us again for more witchcraft tales. Thank you. Bye bye.